So at this point, uh, like we said, every time we do a blaze, we do a three-week session. Uh, we've been journeying through the Apostles' Creed. Uh, we talk a little bit about suffering. And uh, we've got Tom and Mary Walker to come up here to uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, these guys have been around the parish for uh, forever and ever and ever, and they're awesome. Uh, we love these guys. Uh, Tom helps with the men's spirituality. He's been involved in the men's club. Um, Mary's a, a, a great uh, participant in all, all kind of parish activities. So we appreciate the, the walkers coming up and giving us a witness today. Thanks. Once again, Tom and Mary Walker. It's him. You all, you all know him. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My God, I believe, I adore, and I hope, and I love Thee. I ask pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love Thee. Amen. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore Thee profoundly. I offer Thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences whereby he is offended. And through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of thee the conversion of poor sinners. Amen. O most holy Trinity, I adore you. My God, my God, I love you. In the most blessed sacrament, amen. So when I was approached by Father Jack in subsequent conversations, the only thing that came up was suffering. And then I saw the email blast that came out the other day, suffering and death. <laughs> suffering, succotash. I, I could see people reading it. We got to bring the kids to this one. But anyway, I resolved. When I go through death, I'll be happy to come back and do a presentation on it. We may, we may need a bigger venue. Anyway, I was thinking about how to begin this, and I thought it would put everyone in the right mood. A brief clip from one of my favorite Catholic philosophers on the ultimate fulfillment of living a faithful Catholic life. No, he is not a Catholic It's not father. running yet, honey. Oops. Prediction? Yes, prediction. Pain. There you go. As I said, he is not a Catholic philosopher. He is a philosopher, though. That is just his sense of humor. Well, without further ado. But like I said, pain, this is pain, me being up here. You say opposites attract, well, we're opposites. You can see how much he totally enjoys us. I am shaking like a leaf inside. Um, when Father asked us to do this, I told him, sure, he'll do it, and I'll be a Vanna. I'll just be Vanna White and just let him present. But Father wasn't too happy with that, so I will be doing a little bit of talking. I am a bit of a goofball, but I'm your goofball here. <laughs> So without further ado, uh, let Mary tell you a little bit more about us and our family. Well, we were introduced as Tom and Mary Walker, but I don't call him Tom. I call him Tex. That's his college nickname. As you can see, that, that's us, why he was called Tex. It's not working. As you can see, why he is called Tex, he looked like the marble man in college. Um, we went to the College of Charleston. We dated for four years. Then we got married, moved to Savannah for a while. Um, well, originally, I'm from Charleston, and he's from Columbus, Ohio. Then we moved to Savannah. Oh, wait. Ohio! Uh, <laughs> all right, we moved to Savannah. Uh, his first job took us there. Then we came here to Lawrenceville for another job, went to St. Lawrence, and then we moved here in 2002, and that's when we joined St. Monica's. Um, I am a retired teacher, taught for 33 years. Tex is still working in the IT profession. 
He works out in Alpharetta. We have three sons. Two are married. We have three grandsons and one granddaughter. The two youngest ones are in the military. The younger one, as we're talking, he's packing his bags and getting ready to go to Afghanistan at the end of the month. So I will need your prayers for that. Um, I had a little trepidation about this subject because um, I didn't want to come across as like, we're the Alabama of suffering, you know, the, the AP top 25 suffering poll number one. So I left my uh, number one foam finger at home. But, um, you know, Father Jack reassured me, it's not about that, it's more about what impact that has had on our spiritual journey. So I hope that comes out. Um, Things really got rocky in 2008 when I lost my job of about 15 years. And I would say that journey, uh, which wasn't totally resolved until about 2014, was learning humili humility. And uh, part of humility is being humiliated. And uh, there was a lot of humiliation going through that. Probably some of it I put on myself. Uh, quick story, quick example, part of the frustration of that process was being told numerous times, you have a great resume, so why can't I get a job? And then I finally landed a contractor position, and my first interview, the first thing in the department head, he sits me down, he, he's looking at my resume, and he goes, what is your story? Your resume is garbage. <laughs> He used a more colorful word than garbage. But um, from that um, thing is, you know, basically humility was part of the package. I was a very prideful person in, in, uh, in many ways. Um, the, uh, right on the tails of that, when I think she was getting a little frustrated with my lack of getting a job, uh, we were in a bad auto accident, and um, her ankle was very, very badly damaged, and she was out of, out of work for almost a year. And uh, I'll let her tell you more about that. Then there was every, uh, everybody's friend, cancer, uh, both of us. Um, Mary's had uh, breast cancer and had a double mastectomy and is, you know, continuing to be treated, and I've had melanoma and... Uh, prostate cancer, and I still got more treatment ahead of me about that. But uh, I thought about this on the way over. Do you all love those PSAs that they have where they talk, the celebrities who remember are talking to cancer like, cancer's a person? You're going down, cancer. you a clown. Got like rappers, rappers against cancer. you a clown, cancer. You're going down. Anyway, thought I'd share that. That's a part of the script. Totally irrelevant. <laughs> then in 2015, on top of that, I came down with a charming condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And you saw the fruits of that when I dropped my mic. I wasn't quite agile enough to reach down and get it. And it's a um, neurological disorder. And um, a lot of mysteries about it, like how people get it. Um, but... Um, I'm one of the lucky 5% that hasn't fully recovered. You know, I've got nerve damage in my hands and feet. Uh, but fortunately, you know, I'm able to drive and do my job type. And, and it gets me out of a lot of, you know, like, hey, let's go uh, help these people move furniture. You know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no can do, you know. I'm also a popular guy at work at driving for lunch because I got the tag, you know, we, we pull right up. <laughs> Tom's driving. So. Um, and in the midst of that, outside of us, uh, my son Chris was diagnosed with a brain tumor, the, uh, the kid in the middle. And uh, he had a two-year ordeal of anxiety and uncertainty. And uh, Mary will tell you more about that, too. Finally, the greatest suffering of all is I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. <laughs> but 
If you read Aquinas, he would say that that is a free will issue, and I really don't get any credit for that. <laughs> so what was the good that come, came out of all this? Um, really motivated uh, me to, after I lost my job and I was frustrated, I said, well, I've been raised Catholic, 12 years of Catholic school, but I am one of the classically poorly catechized. So I'm going to learn more about this whole Catholic thing and uh, decide whether I want to be Catholic or Jewish or join ISIS or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm going to do. And uh, God put, it just, it's a, too, too much detail to go in and hear the people that came into my life, the things that happened, but um, I feel I have a really good friendship with Jesus Christ now in my church, and I've still got a long way to go. Um, I have a couple of essential points I wanted to uh, quotes that have guided me through this process. One's from C.S. Lewis. Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important, and that's, that drives me. And I love this scripture, amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. And that's Christ, Christ on the beach talking to Peter, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to be taken somewhere where we don't want to go, but are we going to be taken by life? screaming and kicking and being dragged? Are we going to dutifully pick up our cross and follow Jesus wherever he leads us? As you can tell, he loves doing this. This is really hard for me, but I'm going to try to share with you the hardships that have really helped us appreciate what we've gone through. And it's, they've, a lot of them turn into blessings. As he said, in 2009, while he was unemployed, we were in a wreck. I could not work for a year, so not much of an income. Um, I had to wait three weeks for surgery, wasn't able to walk for about four or five months, and so I had to live on the couch. And while living on the couch, I would look at the leg that was injured or the ankle that would, was injured, and the, that's the only thing that would really helped me get through this. I would say, okay, I've got an ankle that's destroyed. And then I would look at the cross, and I'd see Jesus, and I'd say, okay, he has both feet and hands nailed to the cross. How can I complain? And so it was looking at the cross that really helped me get through the hardships of the wreck. Um, things started picking up and going up, doing pretty well. Um, I returned back to work. He finally got a job. So I, I decided to retire. I had taught for 33 and a half years. Um, the middle son was about to have his first child. They were going to go to Korea. So I said I wanted to spend some time with them, travel. Well, it didn't happen. Uh, the grandchild was born in February. At the end of March, that's when he started coming down with his Guillain Beret. Within six weeks, I had a husband who was walking, talking, acting very normal, to one that could barely, I mean, he fell down picking up the newspaper in the driveway and had to crawl to a fire hydrant to get himself up. Um, we took him to a doctor. We were given several uh, neurologists to call to try to find out what was wrong with him. None of them could see him for a month or two. So in desperation, we pulled up my insurance list and looked under neurologist. First one, Albert Cook. Called him. He could see him the next day. As soon as we walked in, he knew immediately what was wrong with him. He did admit him, wanted to run tests to be 100% sure, and we were so blessed because Dr. Cook used to teach Guillain Barre at Emory. He was their Emory expert. So we were, I mean, the good Lord was definitely looking out for us because while we were in the hospital, we had heard that people would get this condition would go undiagnosed, and not only does it affect your arm and your legs, but it goes to your lungs, and people end up dying. And fortunately, that didn't happen. Um, Tom, after Tom got his strength back, 
two, three months later, I find out I get cancer. And it was a double mastectomy. Not only did I have to go through the double mastectomy, I had cancer in my lymph nodes, so I was gonna need chemo and radiation. While going through chemo, he, we would have a lot of people say, oh, we're praying for you, praying for you. And a lot of times I was thinking, well, I don't think God's listening because I sure don't feel it. It, it was hard, especially when I had to lose my hair. Um, so I was having a, a hard time, and when I finally got my strength back at, toward the end of chemo, I had a good many of you share with me that, oh, we're praying, we're praying. And then a lot of the friends were saying, we're praying the rosary for you. And a good many of these people were from the patriotic rosary. And so I, I, it hit me. I go, all these people are praying for you. <laughs> Why aren't you at the patriotic rosary? So I'm inviting you, if you're free on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock, to join the Patriotic Rosary, because it did help me get through the ordeals we're going through. Also, right between my chemo and radiation, we get a phone call in June from Christopher saying that he had been having seizures. Now, he's over in Korea. So I talked to my oncologist and radiologists and they said if I had to go to Korea to help take care of him and his wife and child that, that I could delay my radiation for a month or two. Well that didn't happen. Um, the army uh, would not, how would I say, they wouldn't touch him. His tumor was too deep. So we were blessed because they wouldn't touch him. He went through several you know, hospital, his records went to several hospitals, and finally they allowed him last Christmas to come to Atlanta to go to Emory. While he, was at, while he was in Atlanta, once again, he saw many doctors. He met one at Emory that he really liked because this doctor kept on saying he would operate on him with an ablation, which is, sur which is laser surgery. Every other doctor, including if he did get operated on by the Army, they were going to do a craniotomy. Well, it took a year for us to get everything organized and coordinated with the Army in Emory, and I'm happy to say that on December 13th, this past Christmas, he finally had his operation. The, operation, the tumor was benign. Um, it was called a D-net. It was one that the very first doctor he saw in Korea, he didn't really want to go to an Army doctor, he told him it was a D-net, but every, every American doctor and Army doctor said, oh, no, no, it's too deep. You're too old. A D-net is when you're in adolescence. So he is perfect now. Um, he, believe it or not, he had the operation on, as I said, December 13th. 22 hours later, we're sitting at the dinner table. They released him. He came home, and his two other brothers saying, what are we going to do tonight? Well, they convinced him to go to a bar and go play trivia. So 22 hours after him having brain surgery, he's in a bar playing trivia with his brothers. Now, he didn't look too good because he had to have a, a brace around his head. He had screw marks, and he had, you know. Bolts in his neck. Yeah. But, I mean, across the room, you couldn't tell he had brain surgery. When you got up close, you could. And the, the other brothers would say, well, Mom, he's just going to be sitting in a chair. That's all he's going to be doing here. So we, we were very blessed. It was the best Christmas present anyone could have ever received. Um, then, now we're still worrying and waiting about his cancer. Um, he had his prostate taken out June 1st. Usually one heals quite well, but because it's Guillain Barre, he has a lot of complications with it. So he, it took him a while to have a PET scan. He finally had his PET scan done the, the first week of January, and February 12th, we are going to have his PET scan um, read for us. So please keep him in your prayers. I know I ran over time. I, oh, okay. Thank you, dear. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, a group of guys that have been a tremendous support to me, and one of them came out today. He's a parishioner of St. Lawrence. Randy, would you stand up and wave to the crowd? And, 
what I've learned from these guys um, has just been tremendous. Um, another thing I learned is what happens to you can be God calling you to a task. Um, we were driving uh, on a trip and uh, listening to EWTN, and they talked about the opportunity. The FCC hadn't done this in over 20 years. Uh, you could apply to, to, uh, um, for a, to be an LPFM, a low-powered FM station, and Mother Angelica chimed in, we're going to take over the world with Catholic radio. And some voice in my head said, do it. You know, it didn't say, check in, check in on it, uh, you know, see, see if you can do it. It was, do it. And uh, we did it. And uh, that uh, we pray here at St. Monica's for God's perfect timing. And it was illustrated throughout that whole process. And, you know, paperwork got submitted on time. Uh, bills got paid on time. The people, uh, Ken and Pat Shivers, came in on time to pick up the ball and run with it. He finally uh, got a job. Yeah. I, um, Mark Alestra and, and many other people who were there and have made this thing a success. Um, you know, I was just a tool, keyword tool, but uh, it would have happened. God would have just used another tool, but he said, that's a good, good looking tool. I'll use that one. <laughs> and <laughs> what I learned, I'm going to put put in the framework of Curcio. Number one is the power of prayer. Um, early in the process, I met a retired priest named Father Charlie Brown, who did a presentation and established for me a personal prayer life, a prayer plan, which has grown over time. Um, the sacraments, the mass, adoration, and the rosary are powerful, powerful components of, of that journey of friendship with Jesus Christ. Uh, the second thing is study, study of scripture. I never read the Bible until the uh, last few years. And, you know, good uh, Catholic reading. Um, Father Okeke talked about, uh, Father Charles would talk about that sewer pipe down into your living room, you know, from the cable, and uh, there is like EWTN, uh, just tremendous resources uh, if you look for it, and uh, and the Cartoon Channel. I love that Scooby Doo. <laughs> I use that line raising my kids. They got me in trouble all the time. If it wasn't for you darn kids, I would have gotten away with it, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, finally, tangible trust. And what do I mean by tangible trust? Uh, St. Faustina gave us a great prayer, you know, Jesus, I trust in you, um, but how can you make that tangible, prove that I really trust? And I would just call on everyone, encourage you to prayerfully consider the tithe and your giving, you know, in general to other people, you know, your, um, cause that's a tangible way of expressing, uh, yeah, I do trust. Especially if I know people have been through job loss, you're tempted. Satan wants to tempt you to say, well, I'll cut my, you know, I'll cut my giving because I can't afford it now. And um, you can cut other things. Like I stopped playing golf. Um, you know, your personal pleasures you can cut into. And I would say an even more powerful expression in the face of that is even consider upping your giving in, in, uh, when you're, you're facing that kind of hardship. And she approves of this message. You know, give until it hurts. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening. And um, God bless everyone. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, sir. Awesome. God bless you guys. Thank you. What a great gift to the parish, this couple. Um, the Ablaze Radio was, was Tom's inspiration. And he, he said, this is a crazy thing I heard on the radio, and everybody thought he was crazy. But here we are. We have the radio station going, and it, it's blasting out to the world. 
people in Russia, China listen to the Ablaze radio. It's fantastic. Um, great evangelization opportunity. Um, thanks, to, thanks to Tom and his uh, inspiration. Um, so thank you for these guys coming up here. Um, now we do our table talk, and we have a couple of questions for you. The first question is, what have I learned and profited from in experiencing trial and suffering in my faith journey? We'll take about five minutes for that question. Good conversation. Good conversation. Uh, we do have a little bit of uh, French toast left over if you want to grab that. If you're going to 1030 Mass, of course, uh, remember to honor the fast so you have enough time. Um, we have one other question. So we'll do one more question. How and why does sin cause human suffering? How and why does sin cause human suffering? We'll take about five minutes for that question. Let's have Father Jack come up and give us our send off in prayer. Thanks, Father Jack. Wow, I like that. Why I like it? Ah, uh, here we are. Okay, awesome. Hey, now what's so beautiful too is how many in you this room knew that Tom Walker was the inspiration behind behind the Blaze Radio. Not many people, you know. And that was, he was such a, a servant there. He just came in, and I'd be going like, okay, Tom, if you do all the work. Okay, Tom, if you do all the work. And I was like, we'll never get a radio station. He, did, he kept moving it forward. And I'm very confident that um, a lot of his suffering and Mary's suffering is based on the fact of that effectiveness. I don't think the devil was too happy with it. Um, but what was even more beautiful was not just his heart resonating in Mary's heart too to promote the radio station but that they never became discouraged when all these things hit them that's a beautiful thing isn't it and as much as that radio station's powerful their witness as a couple is more powerful right so that's the witness we give is is so much converts the hearts of people through enduring the suffering of the world well that's our greatest witness so much of what converts, it's not our consolations that convert people. It's our ability to bear the cross that converts people because people know the cross. Many of us will never know consolation or very much consolation, but we do know the cross. And I think that's the greatest converting power that I've seen. The thing that has deepened my priesthood has always been the endurance of my parishioners is their faithfulness in the midst of all types of unbelievable suffering. You know, almost every time there's a witness, I, I, I was, today I was with, with some folks and I was sitting there, I was going like, every time I'm hearing, I'm hearing a phenomenal witness and then I hear somebody at the table give an incredible witness that opens heart, doesn't it? We've shared so much as a group here, a lot of us did not know what suffering other people have been through and then we, realize all of us have been through that cross haven't we and that's really what unites us that great power so i want to thank you for your witness it was, it was absolutely beautiful whenever i hear tom speak it's like being in eighth grade again he's like the guy who would have got me in trouble because i would have laughed all during class and sister celestine would have said what are you doing i said it's his fault he's over there cracking these jokes you see is it so that was uh yeah that was the only time my dad really got upset was when I was with uh, Kenneth Hayes at Mass. And it was the worst curse that ever befell me. We came, we came into Mass, 
And Kenneth was on the front row mystically. I don't know how. He's the least well-behaved child in the whole school, St. Eugene's. And because there was such a crowd, I was sent up front to sit next to him. (laughs) And so my father had to endure me sitting next to him and laughing throughout most of the Holy Liturgy. My dad was not impressed. (laughs) That was the one time I received corporal punishment from my father. But I was, you know, I couldn't use the excuse, but he's so funny. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, now morning prayer, we're going to do all these beautiful things here. Morning prayer, the prayer of the angel of peace, the Eucharistic prayer, mental prayer with the rosary. Again, this examination of conscience based on the Fatima message. Have I prayed the rosary? Did I intercede for others today? Did I accept all the suffering sent with God's permission to me this day? Offering in reparation for my sins, the sins of others, especially those most in need of this help. Did God's light remain in me and did I share this light with others? I, that's been helpful for me. Like I'm in situations and it starts getting kind of gray or a little bit dark and I say, am I bringing light here? And as simple as that sounds, it really changes my affect, what I say, how I listen, you know, the way I, I throw, you know, how am I looking at these people? Am I bringing light here, okay? In the light of God's truth and love and distinguishing between mortal and venial sin, did I advance this day towards heaven, purgatory, hell? Are we moving in the right direction? Let me tell you, that's an important thing. Um, Today, you know, on the weekends where we go through the Archbishop's annual appeal, you know, whenever I celebrate Mass, the first one I go to, I I think about it. The next one is kind of hard to sit through. So I wrote a Super Bowl prayer today. I want to share that with you. Um, Because I've been meditating a lot on sports lately. Now, I am an Eagles fan. I have to have to be transparent with you. So I'll be going to visit my parents. And and, but but I was thinking this prayer today because I really feel I want to save sports. Our sports is really kind of going down the tubes in our country morally. And so I came up with this prayer today. Christ Jesus, you are our victor this on Super Bowl Sunday. Our feast as we gather for our parties. Protect us by your blood and cross. From ourselves as we celebrate, keep us from all gluttony, drunkenness, immodesty, and lust. May we promote recreation, not revelry, friendship, not fanaticism, gamesmanship, not greed, sportsmanship and self-discipline, not self-promotion and swagger. Keep men from abusing women. Make our men particular particularly athletes, brave protectors, not predators, and our women confident, self-possessed, and modest. Jesus, may uh, we crowd our cathedrals more than our stadiums. May we spend more time before the tabernacle than before the TV. May the brawlers and drunkards taken to the holding cells of our coliseums run in repentance to the confessionals of our cathedrals. Protect our recreation from terrorists who would attempt to steal our joy. But may we all stand as one nation and kneel as one family of God. Amen. Amen. That's my favorite last line, that one right there. Amen. Praise God. Maybe they'll invite me to the Super Bowl next time. What do you think, huh? So yeah, it's a little bit of, we really need, when we look at sports, Whatever level you work on in sports or participate, we need to work on being true sportsmen and sportswomen. And we need to focus on a lot of what's happening now in that realm is based on basically men and their inappropriate priorities. And we've got to change. Men have got to take the lead in this. Okay? So I'd ask uh, that we would pray a lot about our sports. Because I don't want to quit. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to opt out of sports just because we're Catholic, right? Uh, you know, we were big promoters of sports, right? How many gyms did we fill? How many teams have we fielded, right? And why has it changed so much? And it's because of poor leadership among men. And we got to change. We have got to change that. So anyway, I want you to pray about that. But before we go on our mission, if everyone would stand, please. And what is most important today... Woo! Here we go. On the road 
I, I do. I'd like some support. And like I said today, the liturgical colors are green. Today. Uh, so <laughs> let us pray. This is getting a little scary here. Okay, that, that's good. All right. Okay. I'm not the false idol of sports. Get it out of my mind. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Mary, we turn to you. You are our queen. In your meekness, you have conquered all hearts. So we entrust ours to you as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. All right. Go Eagles. Thanks, Father Jack. <laughs> Appreciate all the help. Everybody coming out. Enjoy your day.